If you're into bonsai, you know it's about growing trees in trays and pots. But there are other reasons to keep small trees contained. We'll have more on that and answers to all your Northland growing concerns on this edition of Great Gardening, straight ahead. It really is a special environment. I love the organization of the petals. It's a Campanula, Campanula conglomerata. Hummingbirds will go there, the bees are all over the place. Urban gardening is a wonderful thing. Hello and welcome back to Great Gardening. I'm Pamela Fish and our resident garden experts are here as well. They are horticulturist and educator Bob Olin and Bending Birch's greenhouse owner Tom Casper. Hi guys. Hi. Uh, interesting week weather-wise with the heat and the cold and the wind and I mean we had a little bit of everything except not yeah. snow thankfully. Yeah, remarkable yeah. change in seasons, right? Yeah, so what's it? what does that mean for our, for our gardens and for well, our uh, outdoor landscapes. Obviously, we're off to an early start. We drove the frost out. We've got warmer soil temperatures, but I think, um, you know, you still have to be a little ca cautious with frost-sensitive materials, would you say, Tom? I'd agree, Bob. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we agree on something so early yeah. in the program. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> our phone volunteers this week are the Lake Superior Master Gardeners. They are ready and willing to take your calls with questions for Bob and Tom. The numbers are there on your screen. We have a local number, we have a toll-free long-distance number, or you can email askgardening at wdse.org. Uh, here now are this week's signs of the season. And look at those blooms, beautiful. Uh, things are just popping out all over, aren't they? And uh, of course, the marsh marigolds are out, and we're finding those all over. Um, this is a, an aspen tree, I think Ted told us, yeah. the, the yeah, leaves of an aspen, aspen tree. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Quaking aspen, notice it blowing It's quaking, the it is. Mm -hmm. And look at this, this is crazy. But it was really hot that, uh, was it Wednesday? Yes. When these kids were uh, braving, all braving all it on Wisconsin all Point. All I can say is they either don't have any nerves in their feet or brains in their head. Yeah. <laughs> well, they're young. Yes, they're that young, makes for sure. Okay. Well, right now we want to um, talk about some, actually we're going to ask some questions. We're going to go to some questions first because there were some held over from last week. Um, the emailed questions didn't come through for some reason, and I kind of felt bad about that because didn't, they didn't uh, register until after the show, so technical yeah. difficulty, we I guess. We know about things not but registering <laughs> right now. <laughs> Sorry, Bob. But Tom from Duluth was asking about a large yellow patch of grass in his yard. He raked out the loose material. I was wondering about fertilizing to try and um, fill that in or make it green. Well, Tom and I can talk about that. The yellow patch, you know, the first thing that obviously comes to mind would be either uh, dog damage from urine or salt damage would be the first two things that might come to mind. It uh, could be any number of other things, but uh, I would say you always want to stay away from the fertility. Uh, I would start really, particularly if the drainage is good, by just flushing it with a little more water. It's been dry. Try to flush out any salts that might be there, any residue that might be there. And then scraping out the dead material, a little topsoil, and, and reseeding. Uh, I, I, you know, at this point, we really can't point to fungal disease or anything else too early to make that kind of determination. Sounds like winter kill and salt and animal damage okay. are the first two possibilities. Sounds good. All right. Kim from Cloquet is wondering, is it okay to divide my hostas now? Sure. Yeah, it's a good time, you know, they're just starting to come up, depending on where she lives. Right. But a perfect time to divide them and, uh, and get them ready for the season, so. Another hosta question for you. Let's, let's go right to this. Denny in Mattawa has four-year-old hostas that have always bloomed, but right now they're not showing any signs of growth. Do you think it's too early maybe, or? It, it depends really on the location. Uh, you know, the north side of the house or the east side that maybe doesn't get as much sun or heat, uh, it could still be popping out, so I wouldn't lose hope on it yet. It is late by normal season standards, but sure. we certainly aren't in the middle of a normal season at this point. So. And Tom, you know, as you mentioned, we've got different locations. Another thing that's a big factor is soil type. Sands pop early, so if you've got um, an asparagus bed or something in sand, it'll jump out. If it's in a heavier clay, it takes longer because it's cooler. Okay. Um, Paul from up on the North Shore planted five to six foot high spruce 
white pine and balsam and is wondering what to fertilize with. None of them really require a lot of fertility. Okay. Uh, they're slow growers. I think that this time of year, you could use just a, um, a nitrogen fertilizer. A uh, lawn fertilizer would be perfectly adequate in most situations if you don't have a soil test. And uh, I think you want to apply it uh, not real liberally just before rain, and, and this would be a good time to do that, right about okay. the drip line of the tree. But that one application is going to be enough. They don't really require a lot of fertility. All right. Uh, Debbie wants to know how to combat those white worms from spotted wing Drosophila, or is is that technically a fruit fly or not? It's like a fruit fly. It's like yes, a fruit fly, is. and it's in the raspberries. Of course, we've talked about it many times, and uh, um, it's the answer we'd all like to have. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> right. as we get closer to harvest season, maybe we'll talk we, a little we more can about share what can be done. A few things, and I would say right now people are planting, and one of the strategies I'm using is to try to get the earlier maturing raspberries. Mm. The Drosophila itself, the fly deposits the eggs in late July. So anything, any fruit that matures before that, we don't have the problem. So Killarney would be the variety. If you're planting new varieties, I'd select that one. Uh, we still love Moyne and Nova and Latham and the other others that we recommend, but they're a little later to mature. So there are some better controls, some natural c controls coming. There have been research teams that have gone back to China where that pest originated from and they just don't have some of these parasitic wasps available for commercial introduction yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Diane wants to know, can you mulch blueberries to keep the weeds away? She's from Pike Lake. Mm -hmm. well, def definitely want to do that. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of wood chip mulches, and again, we've talked about this. Stay away from the aspen chips if you can. Uh, pine or, or hardwood would be probably better. We can have a phenomenon called sour mulch sometimes when, uh, when aspen begins to decompose. Uh, I think it's a it's a good idea. You might not get them all because they like to penetrate uh, through a, an open mulch like that. But uh, certainly when you're planting, if you've got them weed-free, mulch heavy and, and mulch every year, and any quack grass that comes in, dig it out immediately, then you can control it non-chemically. Yeah. Reapply as that mulch breaks down every year. Yeah, it, or a thick layer of leaf uh, mulch, things like that will also nicely break down and also keep those weeds down. So. Okay. Well, we'll get to more questions in a little bit, but let's look at some potted trees now. And um, when we talk about trees and pots, First, this first one here, the Japanese maple, is one that you've grown, Tom, and it's a favorite of many people, but is it zone friendly? Tell us, it, tell us a little more about it. Um, really not zone friendly, planted in the ground or uh, certainly in a container. So if you're going to grow something like that, you have to create some sort of provision mm -hmm. to uh, protect it during the winter. I know some folks uh, will bring them in their garage. Even an, uh, an attached, unheated garage will generally stay warm enough for those during most winters. Um, how I protected mine was I actually took it container and all and turned it on its side, oh. uh, partially burying it and then covering it with bags of leaves. And I did that for about a decade and it survived. And each spring I'd dig it out from the leaves and the uh, buds would pop and I'd have another great season wow. with the Japanese maple. So. Well, great to hear about that success. Worth a try, I guess. Yeah. Um, and then uh, people often will grow small conifers in containers like these and um, how does that work? Well, you know, right. with the conifers, it's the same thing. They're not going to be winter hardy, but so much is being done in containers right now. So during the season, I think they're fine. Uh, ceramic containers or cement containers like that can actually accumulate some heat. Some of these trees are not really comfortable with that, so sometimes uh, a more porous container might be uh, more advantageous. Once again, you've got to develop a winter, an overwintering strategy, which could again be burying them or tipping them or collecting bags of leaves around them. And I mulched in a number of apple trees this year. Um, you could sink the whole pot if you wanted to, but that's a lot of work, and I've noticed that. Uh, as we all get a little older, even though we're denying <laughs> it, <laughs> that shovel work late in the season is not too appealing. Yeah. So a lot of straw around there. Mouse control, Tom, I've, I've found that tipping, I've got to have something there to control the mice that like to go after that. So maybe um, a little bit of protected decon or some product like that that's in a in an open can so it doesn't get wet and around the shrubs for protection from the mice. Okay, some considerations. Other, um, Po uh, trees, rather, that were um, suggesti suggested to be put in patio pots on uh, amber maple, cherry dogwood. Sure, those both work. Uh, mm -hmm. 
Acer Janello, the Amber Maple is a small, large shrub, small tree, and that's that's certainly adequate. And then you mentioned, Tom, a Dolgo crab. <laughs> Dolgo crab uh, probably has one of the hardiest root systems of, of m any of the trees that you would want to choose for to use in a container and, and have shown some level of success in containers in other communi northern communities. So. Okay. And could we suggest, if you are going to plant an apple where you have a choice of rootstocks, this would be where it would be very appropriate to get a dwarfing rootstock because uh, otherwise you get this phenomenon called girdling roots if you want to leave them in there for long periods of time, 15 or 20 years, and that can be detrimental to the tree. So smaller stature in the pot, large pot, small tree. So get as big a pot as you can mm -hmm. and as small a tree as you can, and that and combination will work. We have a tree here behind you guys. This is uh, a lilac tree form. Mm -hmm. And uh, tell us a little bit about that. That's new this year, right, Tom? Yeah, so that's the, the blooming one we've talked about a couple times that reblooms uh, once later in the season. And uh, of course, uh, the, and it's from the common lilac family, so it's very, very hardy for our northern climate. I don't know how hardy it is in a container if, if you could leave it unprotected during mm -hmm. the winter, but if folks wanted to put it in a container and do some sort of protection, it would probably do pretty well in that situation. Okay. So. All right. You know, this is kind of an interesting phenomenon, mm -hmm. uh, and we're seeing more of these, you know, the, think of the uh, tree peonies and, right. and um, lantana. I've seen the tree form of lantana right. now. Said that. And you'll see some of those, uh, I'll just use it, Essentia Health, I believe, is going to have some set out with the tree lantana. So in front of some of their buildings, you can take a look at that. That's rather unique. So I think this is a trend that's new and uh, being more widely ad adopted. Okay. We have a huge pile of questions already. Let's get to them. <laughs> Suzanne and Deleuze says, can I take down my temporary fencing around my garden after the plants bloom? Um, uh, I'm not sure why she'd want to do that. Okay. It, as far as, if she's talking about as far as deer problems, it's only going to intensify, so she's going to want to keep that right. fence up. So. Okay. And w as we've talked about before, you never want to let them have a taste. Right. Once they've had a taste, then almost any fence won't keep They'll them come out. Back. So keep it up. All right, from Colleen in Lakeside, how do I establish hollyhocks in my garden? Well, well that's a challenge. Uh, a lot of folks will, you can collect seeds in the fall from them and germinate them in the spring and plant them in the garden and repeat that. They generally aren't going to last real long as a perennial, so you really want to continually be adding hollyhocks to the garden, either through collected seeds or purchasing at uh, greenhouses or garden centers. So. Okay. Eric in Lakeside says, for a garden that's less fallow, does it help to plant alfalfa for one season? Um, you know, for one season, definitely. Now, you, you must understand alfalfa is a nitrogen fixer, so you're mm -hmm. going to get nitrogen in the soil, but only if everything is incorporated. So all that biomass, the same thing if you're planting uh, a pea crop or a legume. Uh, you can't harvest any of the top stock. That all has to go down in the ground if you're actually going to have a net addition of nitrogen to your soil, but certainly, um, definitely a, a good cover crop, one of many. There might be easier crops to establish. Alfalfa, you have, you know, you need a high pH for mm -hmm. alfalfa, which is a little different than our native soils, and much of it, it's not necessarily going to be real winter hardy for you. You got to be careful about your variety selection. So, it, it's one of several cover crops that certainly could be used. Here are three. I mean. That one was easy compared to these bugs. Okay, here, here we go, Tom. <laughs> how do I get rid of Creeping Charlie from Barb and Lake Nebagaman? How do I get rid of Dandelions from Shelby? How do I get rid of Horsetail from Matt Ooh. and Duluth? Ooh. Those, Those are, all are three of the toughies, aren't the they? The Dandelions yeah. are the easy ones yeah. if you really want to get rid of it. and. Um, those can be dug, and we try to give people some options. You never want to let them go to flower, so you want to make sure that you're continually mowing. That could be, uh, you know, even a couple times a week, two, three times a week, get the flowers off. And uh, some of the more prevalent uh, broadleaf herbicides would have been with us for a long time will take care of dandelion without any trouble. Not necessarily true of uh, Creeping Charlie, one yeah. of the others that you mentioned. I have a lot of that if anyone yeah. needs some. <laughs> there, there certainly are some products, though, and you want to read the labels and uh, follow the recommendations uh, rather than give you a lot of technical uh, terminology for some of the active ingredients. But we have two or three that are sold over the counter. Uh, I think part of the key is uh, early fall application. That's the most effective for controlling uh, Creeping Charlie. All right. 
Okay, and well, Horsetail was the third. Yes, that's right. Um, and really getting after it and continually uh, taking the tops off of it and trying to diminish its strength, but mm -hmm. it ro its root system can be down yeah. two feet down depending on the soil conditions. Very ancient plant, yeah. very durable. And they're so fragile. That, I mean, you go to pull them and the root stays in the Little <laughs> Little <laughs> tip for folks here, uh, they do like acidic soils, so you might want to get out there and drive the pH up with some kind of an alkaline material, mm -hmm. lime, ag lime, calcium carbonate, wood ash, uh, modifying the soils at that point uh, will actually really discourage uh, equisetum or, or horsetail. All right. Well, we're going to get back to more questions in a bit, but one unique way of growing trees in pots is through the practice of bonsai. Here's a Duluth man who has an amazing array in his backyard. Dave Severson, and I uh, live on Niagara Street in Kenwood area. Kathy and I have lived here about uh, 20 years now, and just enjoying being in the backyard uh, has created a kind of a sanctuary in the middle of a lot of busyness in the Kenwood area. A lot of it is actually just sitting and designing, looking. I've found it, especially in the last 10 years since I've been retired, to be a way to meet people, um, to to truly have nothing to do but putts. And that's what happens and that's what the trees facilitate quite nicely. Some of them are native to the area. Uh, quite a number of them are. Others have to be stored in kind of a cold frame because they're not zone hardy. Tamaracks, they are my personal favorite partly because I tend to be thrifty and I can collect them for free. The foliage is just kind of weeping. It, it has a gorgeous yellow color in the fall. The uniqueness comes by styling, which involves uh, pruning and wiring and root work. In bonsai, there's primarily two techniques for uh, moving branches. One is uh, wrapping annealed wire, copper wire, and the other one is called directional pruning, where I just cut. What I'm doing in bonsai is trying to replicate, reproduce age. So like all things in response, even human beings to gravity, that weeping down. So that's why I move the branches down, and part of it is getting it into a pot, reducing the root ball to a point where I can get it fitted into a shallower pot like this. What bonsai means is tree in a pot or tree in a tree. My soil is a combination of pumice and, or, and bark that has composted and then I'll use uh, chicken grit, granite, and um, so it is not soil per se. It really promotes root growth because there's a lot of oxygen. Whenever I water, the oxygen is going right through it. If you see that it's growing into this rock, that probably started 10 years ago. So if you're like into immediate gratification, it's not, it's not gonna work real well for you. This uh, ponderosa pine is in the ballpark of 250 years old. And it was collected about 18 years ago out in the Black Hills, right outside of uh, Custer. Um, you can get permits uh, to collect up to five trees. Anything in the backyard here is at least 15 years old. I'm gonna show you a little boxwood. That is, that is this tall, that's probably about 25 years old. And, and it's just, it's one of those that you'd call cute. It's just cute. This foliage type is really a fun, as you can see, I'm touching it and it's pleasant to touch, it's not prickly. It responds very nicely to uh, pruning. What I'll do is I'll, I'll be going like this in, the, in about a month and taking the terminal growth off, taking anything on the underside to create these clouds. The precipice of, of, of death and recovery and 
That's what gives these trees their character. Well, we've been to Dave's before, and I personally love it there. It's very relaxing, and I yeah, can listen to him for a right. long time, and beautiful trees that he grows. Fun to see that kind of passion. Yeah, yes. it really is. All Great right. Hobby. Well, we have a lot of questions here, guys, so uh, we're moving right on with those again. Sue in Hermantown says, please name some good perennial pond plants and how to overwinter them. Well, probably the best one are, is water lilies. Mm -hmm. And uh, if her pond is deep enough, she doesn't really have to do anything to it. If it's not deep enough, she'll want to bring it again. Uh, she can actually bury it right in her garden or protect it with leaves um, after the season is over. Um, others that work well, water lettuce, parrot uh, flower, um, lotus also can be protected over the winter, similarly to water lilies. Um, and she should have good success with it that way. So. Excellent, yeah, those are so beautiful. Uh, Lori in Cloquet has a 10-year-old grapevines that aren't producing any significant growth this year. Is it too early to tell? Might be a little early, depending okay. on the soil type again, but uh, once again, 10 years old, uh, that isn't necessarily that old. Uh, prune them back, of course, and she should be okay. Nancy in Duluth wants to know, can I cut my climbing rose bush back? Sure. Okay, and that's not yeah. too late for that? And it's not, yeah, it's really not too late. Uh, and you can, it, actually, any time of the year, you can do a little bit of light pruning on them. But certainly, if it's gotten out of hand and she wants to take it back a couple of feet or four or five feet, uh, now's a great time to do that. So. Okay. Cheryl from Duluth wants to know how to get rid of comfrey. Has dug it out and it keeps coming back. And there was one about purslane, too. Purslane and comfrey, yeah. Comfrey is again <laughs> very deep rooted uh, uh. plant so certainly if she wants to go after it continually cutting it or, or trying to remove it and over a period of time it will diminish its its ability to regenerate but it's going to take some time and some effort. So. Or heavy heavy mulch never letting any sunlight penetrate. You know comfrey is very deep rooted, purslane is just the opposite, very shallow rooted. So it's a shallow rooted annual and uh, just a light raking typically uh, you can take it off. I, there are some herbicides that will control it, but I don't think it's necessary. Pretty easy to pull it out of the garden. will always be there because they kick out a lot of seed, but very easy to shallow cultivate and get rid of it. Is purslane the one that people eat sometimes? Purslane is inedible. Yeah. As pigweed is, as lamb cord is, it's just we can't get people to eat enough of these because <laughs> mm -hmm. i got 10 acres of it if they want it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Denny from Mattawa. Oh, this is the Denny who called last week about his four-year-old hostas. They are coming up now. This Great. Week. <laughs> Good advice there. Just be a little patient, All right? right? Yeah. Great, Denny. And then Bob in Superior is wondering what type of watermelon will grow here. Will watermelon grow? Uh, watermelon definitely will. You have to be extremely careful of your varieties. We'll give you a couple. Yellow dolls, one with a yellow flesh. A Lucky Sweets, another one that will, mm. uh, will make it in this area. Uh, you got to kind of push the season, so you might want to start them indoors and then transplant when the danger of frost is past. Okay, excellent. Great, lots of great answers, you guys. Well, it's time now for a look at some of the favorite photos of Garden Fair that's shared with us by our viewers. Proving the power of longevity in nature, Sue Zimski of Pengilly shares the lady slippers she picked up 30 years ago at a small greenhouse when she says, they were just a couple of nubs in a pot. Sue says the lush crop now has close to 50 flowering stems and continues to multiply, despite the work of a squirrel that managed to plant an oak tree among them. Penny Hagberg of Carlton got some gorgeous close-ups of her flowers last spring and summer, including this delicate yellow iris, a hardy rugosa rose, and the full heads of the hydrangea flower. If you have pictures of full blooming flowers, foliage, buds, or even brambles, send them to greatgardening at wdse.org and let us show what you grow. More beautiful flowers and plants, we love to see them. We have time for just a few more questions. So uh, Shirley from Superior is wanting, wondering, does the honeyberry need a male and female plant 
to get berries. I believe those, they are male and female plants, so should, you should get a couple of them. You want to be very careful about the variety selection because there are a lot of varieties that may not be appropriate for this area, but there are many that are appropriate. A lot of them came out of the Saskatoon and the Portland, Oregon uh, breeding programs. Will there ever be enough to buy in stores here? Oh, there should be, yes. And uh, the other thing, if you're locating them, you're planting them, they can get to be very large plants. So I see people putting them in on two inch, two foot spacings, go out about five feet at least, because uh, okay. they are winter hardy and they'll uh, they'll grow to that dimension. Okay. <coughs> Saw one in bloom today. Did you? Yeah, yeah, they're out very early. They're out right now. Mine are growing right now. Are they excellent? Well, um, and we're going to be able to eat them when they well, when have to bring if, some harvest if the birds first? don't get them first or okay. the deer. <laughs> <laughs> We right. believe in sharing our crops. You're going you're to bake us a pie? <laughs> <laughs> if we have any, yes. Um, Ruth from Duluth wants to know how to keep coconut liners in hanging baskets moist. That is a challenge. Uh, and what I recommend for folks to do and what I do with mine is actually put some plastic, whether it's part of a garbage bag or something like that, inside the cocoa liner to hold the soil in place, but to also help hold some of the water in sure. place. So. Okay. With a little perforation in the bottom so there's still a little drainage stuff. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yep. All right. As always, we encourage people to go to our website for more information on Northern Gardening events and past episodes of the show. But we want to thank our phone volunteers, the Lake Superior Master Gardeners Club. Bob, Tom, you guys are the best. <laughs> Honestly, I know I, I've said that before, but you guys are, are, are great with so many answers to so many different questions. and. Um, we appreciate your expertise. Next week, we're going to be asking you about your top picks for tomatoes. And uh, for now, from all of us here, thanks for watching and enjoy the garden.